continue expanding, sprawling out uh, in light of uh, House Bill 7103 that, that basically told county governments they can't set requirements for developers for affordable housing. What's your, what's your opinion on that? House Bill 7103 addresses community development and housing and, it, and it's in effect. Um, at the end of the day, I, it, you know, Aura has, has not taken a, a, a firm position on it. I am concerned at what it says in that um, it's a, the, it, it, the incentives to fully offset all the cost of the housing development uh, of its affordable housing contribution. But if an apartment complex developer is mandated to offer 5% affordable, counties are required to make up the difference between the affordable rate and regular rate. I, that, I'm really not sure when that starts really happening, what that's gonna mean in the long run. And I get concerned about the rule of unintended consequence when government is, is forcing that type of an issue. Um, I'm more in favor of seeing free market seeing government regulation reduced, open doors for, for habitat, for different <coughs> development structures that come in place, like auxiliary housing units and things like that, to create opportunity, um, and then to fully fund the Sadowski and do all those sorts of things and work together to minimize government intrusion. I'm not big on government sticking regulation, and I've testified <coughs> frequently at a couple of, of hearings here in Seminole County specifically about the government doing things that, while they do need to get involved, they're overreaching in some of the ways they're trying to get involved. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Penny, uh, we have a question for you uh, to tell us more about what you do, with whom, and, and uh, your part in the organization. And uh, I'd like to throw in on top of that, if, if someone's interested in, in uh, working with you to build a home or, or to buy a home from you, what's the procedure that that person goes through? Say, say I want to buy one of your homes, and uh, I understand there's a work requirement, things like that. How does that work? So I have one minute to answer these questions. Well, I um, I guess let's just start off with the requirements. That's probably what, um, so it, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, the habitat here in Seminole County or one across the country or across the globe, there's always three requirements for becoming a habitat home owner. Uh, one is the uh, a verifiable housing need. You know, and we talked about some of the reasons that somebody would be, you know, maybe their house uh, cost burdened or their, their house that they're renting is not in good repair and things like that. So that would be a verifiable housing need. The second thing is the ability to pay. So you have to have a, a verifiable steady income. And the third thing is the willingness to partner. And I think that that is one of the things that makes our program so successful. So much like Golden Rule, we send, we partner with the Urban League and we partner with the, with Junior Achievement and we do, and with some banks and some other professionals to put our Habitat homeowners through an education, a series of education um, classes that are mandatory. Uh, and it's everything from uh, how to put together a budget, how to um, uh, monitor your credit, what is your credit made of, understanding your mortgage. Uh, we do civic engagement classes. We um, do uh, a lot. A lot of a lot of different classes to get them through to make sure that we protect the donors' investment and and, and the um, volunteers' investment in this home that, that this family is going to be successful. So it's this we're, we're really this whole development company with social services and everything to get people from start to finish um, through through that process of homeownership and be successful over the 30 years of their mortgage. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. I'm getting you guys trained here. I, I would have liked another 10 minutes. <laughs> you can ignore my next question and pick up where, where you left off here. Um, 
Uh, Cynthia, you know, we were talking before we got started here about, uh, I, I get these calls, um, you know, Chuck, uh, uh, I know this lady, she's living in a motel with her three kids. Um, we're trying to get her housing, do you have anything available, etc. cetera. Um, and you've told me that that happens every day, the same thing. Um, we've got a population of people who are living in motels and hotels all over Central Florida. Is there, I, I know you encourage, uh, your organization encourages home ownership, but what would you, what would you tell somebody who's in that position? <laughs> I'm just asking the questions. <laughs> I, I understand, but that is one that we do answer on a daily basis, and unfortunately, there really isn't much that our agency can do. What we do is we can refer them to the county, but because the county does have a program that can assist with homelessness, however, those funds are very short. Uh, there are also, and this is where community input needs to come in. There's that thing that's called red tape. You have to meet this and meet that and meet this and how can I meet anything when I don't have a place to live? My child is crying. If I have a car, praise the Lord, I got a car, I can sleep in the car. But we have some that don't even have a car and they have families. But when all the restrictions are placed on you, you have to meet this. You have to be able to do this. You got to do this guideline. You, you can't help them. And our organization is about home ownership. So we do work with organizations that are working with that population that they are they are the working poor. That where they are working and we work with them to try to get them into home ownership. But that is going to take time. And immediate need, I'm sorry, we just have to refer them to someone else. But that's where you can start with that consolidated plan, do your public input, let your local government know, find out what kind of restrictions that they have before they can assist someone and make a change at that level. And put Seminole County on the map as somebody that has solved the problem. Amen. To follow up on that and kind of touch on what we talked about the auxiliary housing, uh, could it be a solution, uh, somebody is asking a question about tiny homes and putting a tiny home on a standard single family lot. Uh, Jim, you're, you're, you're a, a city uh, commissioner, uh, not to put you on the spot, but uh, the zonings with, for, I would say 90% of the lots I see, it's a single family zone. That means one kitchen, single family. I mean, this, we're not Donna Reed anymore. I mean, there's so many families that are defined so differently today than they were in the 50s. But we really have zoning requirements from the 50s. I've, I've got a lot in Lake County. I went to see what I could put on. I want to put a small home on it. And they say you have to have a minimum of 1,200 square feet. Well, that just blew the price. It blew the price out of the water. So, um, uh, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to you, and I, I want you to address uh, uh, Jim back there. <laughs> and I want you to convince him that he needs, as a public official, to do something about this single family zone. Go ahead, Jeff. You need to face that. <laughs> Oh, on a piece of paper that's outlined with tiny houses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here, but but here's, where, here's where every one of you come in play. Okay, because we haven't gotten into it yet, but everybody's heard the acronym NIMBY, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And, and what happens is, what we're talking about, frankly, is increasing some density because that's what's going to be required. Seminole County doesn't have a lot of undeveloped land. Okay? So, it, I mean, it's got some, but it doesn't have a lot. It doesn't have as much as last year, or it doesn't even have as much as ours. So, density is one solution for the problem. In other words, increasing the density. And putting more than a 1,200 square foot house 
on a half acre lot. Now that's something that a lot of homeowners get upset about because they've got this and then the first thing that comes in their mind is they make a value judgment about well, who would live in a little thing like that or if it's an, if it's a, an apartment complex that we, we advocated for or I went on the map and said we want we think Seminole County needs this apartment complex. Well there was a whole string all the way wrapped around the commission chamber of people advocated against it. Okay and, and again I got hate mail from submitting testimony. But if I'm going to advocate for affordable housing, I have to advocate for affordable housing. And it's, I'm passionate about that. So we do have to, to, to think about ourselves because we're going to have to increase density over time and have more creative approaches to how to house people. Whether well, it's 3D printed houses, tiny houses, or whatever it is, there's new technology that's coming. Or it's it investigating, or it is investigating 3D printed houses to put on lots that we own that cities have donated to us. So we're trying to do that ourselves. Did Longwood recently approve a group of tiny houses in the I don't know if they did it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a Longwood person, and to summarize, they, they put stuff in the books so you could have tiny homes on tiny lots. That was the whole deal. Okay. Yeah. You're talking about one home per lot? No, well, so they would allow a lot that was zoned for one home to be changed to have multiple tiny homes. Oh, that's good. What, where's yeah. that? Longwood? Longwood, Florida. <laughs> they had to draw the Good neighbors over there. <laughs> <laughs> they had to draw the people. No, no, no. The, the, the originals, but it was passed. All right. Uh, but see, that's just my point. They, they have people get opposed to stuff because they get fearful of it as opposed to looking at opportunity. I, and I do want to say, I, I spoke for it three times. I went to every meeting and I stood up every time and I said, we need this. And we had other people, realtors, come in and do the same thing. So it can happen. You know, I, I was at a party in Maitland, and the guy was telling me he turned his garage into a, a living room, and he rents it out uh, for 2000 a month. What? Uh, 2000 a month. And with that 2000 a month, he's putting his kid through uh, private school. So. <laughs> It's totally illegal, and I'm not suggesting anybody do that. <laughs> David, is this on? Is this camera? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, I got camera. But it's that's one way to put your kids in private school. Uh, all right, Penny, we've got a habitat question here. Um, it, it, and this piggybacks off what Jeff was saying. Uh, does habitat run into problems with this nimbyism? I mean, you go into, what, the habitat homes I've seen are already in pre-existing subdivisions, right? You find a lot, a uh, house from down or whatever, and you build uh, a new house there. Do you get any resistance putting your houses into subdivisions? You know, uh, so I've been with Habitat for 10 years, and only once has that happened, which is actually surprising. I, I, I expected it to happen. I, I expect it at any moment, and, and, it, and it really has only happened once. But we build a really good quality house, and uh, a very energy efficient house. Uh, the houses really are well built, and um, we sell the houses for their appraised value. So it's not like we go in and sell a house you know, for $100,000 when it, when it um, appraises for two hundred. dollars so when we try to stay in keeping with the architecture and the you know the style of the neighborhood, um, we do build garages when we need to, and that's that that fits into the neighborhood. Um, and I, I have to say I'm very pleasantly surprised that we have it, and we do a lot of infill projects where we are in some pretty solidly middle class neighborhoods where I expect that we would get some some blowback, and we haven't. Um, we've tried to include neighbors uh, in some of the things that we do, um, you know, our dedications and our ground for breakings, and to educate them about what's going on um, prior to, but I would say it's only, been, it's only been one time that that's been an issue for us. And who won? Actually, uh, it was interesting. It was, um, we were offered a piece of 
property as a donation, and uh, it was in Maitland, and, and, the, and the neighbors were up in arms. Uh, and I, I declined the donation because I just, I said, you know, I don't want to do that to a home buyer and put them in a hostile environment. That's it's not going to be good for anybody. So we just declined with the, the, um, the donation, which is unfortunate, but I thought it was the best thing for, for a home buyer. So um, other than that, we, we've been very lucky that way. You're really good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. All right, uh, uh, this one's for you, Cynthia. Uh, it's a question about California experimenting with school districts, buildings, apartments, townhouses for teachers. Uh, we've also seen this with employers building uh, housing for, for their people. Uh, Jeff talked about Harris Rosen and Tangible Park. The Tangible Park was really there, right? And he helped improve it. Uh, uh, what's, what's your thought on, uh, for, for instance, UCF? We have a question here. They, they need affordable housing near UCF for students. Um, is that an area, because I know it, it kind of overlaps and goes into Seminole County, is that an area that you uh, with Golden Rule, are building houses, for instance, in, in Oviedo, or helping people find housing that either work at UCF or go to UCF? Because that's your alma mater, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Yeah, right, reminder. <laughs> but um, actually, to build a home in Oviedo is quite expensive these days, and we are talking about the impact fees. Uh, land is not that much um, available in the city of Oviedo anymore. So we have not had an opportunity to build a home in Oviedo in quite a while. And no, we have not experienced or are we working with at this time trying to provide housing for people at UCF at the student level. Now, there is a program through Florida Housing Finance where they can get down payment assistance for teachers, for first responders, for nursing. There is quite a bit of, there are other funds out there other than the SHIP program, other than the Sadowski funds, where there is down payment assistance available. And we, at our organization, try to access all of them, or as many of them as we can. Now, you can use the SHIP program, and we have flyers at, at the front table. It's up to $50,000 in down payment assistance through Seminole County. You can combine that with the bond program, which is another, I believe, $3,500. Um, there are different banks now that are also offering their own down payment assistance programs. There are ways to make it happen. There are there's seller concession. You have sellers that will give back. The lender can give back. The, Realtor can also give up a portion of their commission. <laughs> there are ways to make it happen. It can happen, but as I'm going to say again, it starts with financial management and knowing how to put your money together and working with the parents have to work with the children, put the money on the table, and this is all we have, and this goes here, and this goes here, and this is how we're going to slice this pie, and that's how it goes financial management. All right.